started. Um, my name is Shauna Koch. I am the Sales and Marketing Business Development Manager for IEC Thermo. I have been in the hemp space with IEC for about a year now. Um, a little bit of my experience before that was actually in Washington State's recreational program for I-502. Um, in I-502, I worked in administration and safety, as well as in the garden doing production management and then all of the drying, curing and traceability for 120,000 square foot canopy in constant production. So a lot of my background comes from cannabis itself and I'm kind of applying it to this hemp space um, as we've been moving forward. Um, I'm joined by Matthew Clark. Did you want to introduce yourself, Matthew? Yeah, thanks, Sean. I'm my name is Matthew Clark. I have been with IEC Thermo for about a little over a year also. And then prior to that, I've also worked in recreational cannabis in Washington State. Um, so for about five years now. Um, and so, yeah, pretty good background. Um, I've been lucky to operate a lot of different types of businesses within the industry. So I think it gives us a pretty good practical base. So looking forward to talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to be chatting today on hemp drying basics. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, let's get started here. So hemp drying basics and advanced strategies. Whoops, let's see. So drying is an important part of the process, but it's just that, it is a part. Um, so I want you to think about drying in terms of how it relates to the steps that come before and the steps that come after it. So drying is smack dab in the middle between harvesting and processing. Us at IEC Thermo, we like to look at drying in terms of stabilization. So while it's a very important part of the process, it's just that, it's just a part. Um, a sort of a transition point between harvesting and processing. Um, we want you to think about that in terms of, you know, the whole process as opposed to looking at drying as a standalone process. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Often, um, unfortunately, drying sort of gets overlooked when uh, and lumped in with harvest and processing, um, but it really is its own process. It has its own uh, things to consider. Uh, so you want to make sure that you do that. So in terms of looking at drying, we like to think about it and how it relates to the bigger picture. So the general process flow from seed to sale is cultivation, followed by manufacturing, followed by distribution, followed by the retail aspect. <clears throat> and drying is just one part of that supply chain. So us at IEC Thermo, we like to focus on continuous flow. And what that means is that is matching your capacities in order to avoid bottlenecks. So by keeping product moving continuously through the harvest stage, drying, storage, extraction, through to sales will really be your best bet. The last thing you want to do is be sitting on product or biomass for any extended periods of time. You don't want to harvest, stop. Dry, stop. Store, stop. You want that kind of continuous flow process all the way through. And what that's gonna help with is scalability, being able to plan for growth. You know, what does your one year business plan look like? What does your three year, your five year, your 10 year business plan even, um, if you're getting into this space, how much scalability or room for growth does your initial investment cover? You know, are you going to be needing to expand your capacities and your capabilities within the first year? You know, you're maxing yourself out. Or do you give yourself a little bit of room to grow over the next couple of years knowing, hey, maybe this system is a little bit overkill for where I'm at right now, but I won't need to invest further in the next year knowing I'll be able to scale with my existing infrastructure. Yeah, and that's an important part of making sure that you're matching the different components so that, you know, you're able to, to harvest a certain amount that's going to keep your dryer going, that's going to fit your storage model, that's going to, you know, so you really want to make sure that you're matching as well as thinking about all these parts. Absolutely. And then as you're, you know, getting into the space, as you're building your plan, keep that in mind as well, the different types of equipment. 
Um, so we like to tell people to work backwards. You know, we all love hemp. We're in this for a variety of different reasons. Um, hemp can be made into many different products, whether that's, you know, the CBD or cannabinoid side or the herd side um, or even the hemp oil side. But ask yourself, what is your finished product? What is your business going to specialize in? Are you going to be working with, say, paper products? Or are you going to be dealing with maybe molded plastics? Um, or even the, you know, the essential oils or supplement side, the topicals, the tinctures, um, really define what your finished product is going to look like. And it doesn't have to be just one. You know, this is an incredible plant with incredible things and incredible potential. Um, so you don't want to give yourself tunnel vision. You know, it may not be just one product. You may have a couple of products that you're able to get um, from your hemp. Um, the next question you want to ask yourself is, you know, how are you going to get that from biomass? What processes are you going to put your product through um, to get to your final product? And then one step in front of that is how much hemp do you need to grow to create this product? You know, are you putting thousands of acres in the ground when you could probably get away with maybe 25 or vice versa? Are you only putting five acres in the ground, but you're planning on pumping out 100 acres worth of product? Um, so really just figure it out before you get into the space. And the best way to do that is to work backwards. Yeah, and, and so just to kind of, it's, like Shauna said, you can have more than one product that you're shooting for, but understanding and, and developing your processes and the equipment that you get around that idea is really important. So, you know, obviously there's been, uh, as a price of CBD and, and some biomass and things have gone down, we've seen more people selling smokable flour. Was all of that produced as smokable flour, grown, cured, dried in a way? I'm not 100% sure. So you just really want to think about and also know that, you know, the, the plant doesn't have the same value from top to bottom. Um, it's entirely possible to, if you want to take some portion for smokable flour and take all your best flowers out and then, you know, do a more agricultural harvest of the rest, there's lots of ways to think about it. And so it's just important to realize, um, you know, the value isn't the same in every part of the plant. So you don't necessarily want to put the same amount of work into every part. Exactly, Matthew is exactly right. The plant does not have the same value from the top to the bottom. So we are seeing more and more people um, going towards maybe a three purpose um, crop where they'll harvest, you know, the top foot, the top foot and a half, process that as smokable. Exactly like Matthew said, combine the rest of the field for biomass. Um, and then if you use one of those fancy schmancy stripper headers um, that are out nowadays, that gives you a very discreet fiber product as well. So you'd have your smokable, your CBD biomass, and then a fiber um, application as well. Um, like we said, we like to strive for whole plant utilization. This is an incredible plant. It has hundreds and hundreds of molecules, components, substances, you name it. Every day we're seeing more and more articles and studies coming out with new findings that hemp can be used for. Um, you know, they're coming up with new terpenes and finding new cannabinoids almost daily. Um, so like we said, giving yourself tunnel vision, focusing exclusively on just CBD is just going to hinder your efforts in the long run. Um, it's an incredible plan and we're figuring out more and more uses for it every day. Um, which is kind of why we talk about that stabilization. By stabilizing it, at least that gives you some wiggle room to figure out how you're going to pull it out or how you're going to best extract it. Yeah, that's right, Shauna. And uh, like we said, now that you know the price of CBD has come down a bit, we are certainly seeing a lot more interest in more utilization and people investing in the kind of infrastructure that it'll take to do that. So, um, and then just really thinking about, you know, uh, we need to be looking at how we can automate these processes and eliminate the amount of handwork. You know, if you're producing a smokable flour product, you're going to have to put a certain amount of work into that because you're going to do a hang dry, you're going to cure it, you're going to, you know, trim it in a different way. Um, but if you're producing something that's going to end up in biomass or that you can use some equipment to sort on the back end, there's lots of ways to look at how you can create a really efficient uh, stream that will allow you to utilize all those different parts.
Exactly. Yeah, the continuous flow model is definitely based mostly off of automation. You know, when you can automate, that cuts down on your labor expenses. You know, that cuts down on a number of things by really thinking through that process to create that um, continuous flow model. Um, and what goes hand in hand in that is planning ahead, you know, thinking about harvesting when you're planting, when you are putting seeds into the ground, everything you plant, you will need to take back out. I mean, other than the ones that die and you call along the way. Um, so when you're planting, consider your row width. You know, are your plants 18 inches apart? Are they four feet apart? What does your row width look like? Um, you can see in this bottom picture, they have very distinct rows. The top picture above, not as distinct rows. So chances are they had a little bit of loss by just getting that harvester into the field. You know, they didn't give it that nice alleyway for it to go down. Another thing you're gonna wanna consider is your plant spacing, which goes hand in hand with your plant density. Are your plants piggybacking off of each other or do you give them, you know, a good 18 inches all the way around? Or, you know, what does that look like for you? There's a number of different effects for taking this into consideration. Um, what's great about that, and especially in the growing side, is by giving your plants a lot of space and a lot of room to breathe, you'll actually start to see less issues with maybe mold because there's a lot more airflow between your plants. They're able to ventilate and they're able to breathe a little bit better. Um, another thing when planting is consider your anticipated weight per acre. You know, are you putting 2,000 seeds in the ground? Or are you putting 10,000 seeds in the ground? Those will have drastically different um, impacts come harvest season. So all of these affect your harvesting and your drying capabilities and your capacities. Really looking at it as one continuous process as opposed to individual steps. Yeah, and, and so far we haven't seen a lot of standardization. I mean, you know, there's a wide range of genetics out there. That certainly is another variable into how you're going to do all this. Um, but really it's something you want to consider because you don't want to be, uh, you know, late September, or middle of October with the rain coming down and realize that, you know, to, to, at the density that you've planted, there's no way you're going to be able to, to get down what you planted. Yep, and unfortunately, that's a decision a lot of farmers ended up having to make last year. You know, at what point did they accept the inevitable that they would not be able to harvest everything they planted? And I think that was a pretty, a pretty tough learning lesson for a lot of people last year. Um, so we get this question a lot. Factors affecting CBD during harvest. Um, CBD is affected by a number of different things. You know, you look at CBD the wrong way <laughs> and it disintegrates. Um, but there's a lot of different methods on how you can harvest that so you'll see, you know, slight differences, whether that's good or bad. Um, so your harvesting method that you will definitely see um, a slight difference in your determined harvesting method, whether that's a whole plant harvest or if you're going to come through and combine it or forage shop everything. Another thing that will make a difference is any pre-drying processes. So are you shucking and bucking your product before it's dried? Or are you shredding it? You know, what processes is your product going through between the field and the dryer? Um, another thing that affects is storage until drying. So how you dry, or I'm sorry, how you store your product until it's dry. Um, ultimately, you're going to want climate controlled storage, you know, controlling the humidity, controlling the temperature, um, and then ideally keeping it out of sunlight also if you have that option, um, if you will be storing it before drying. Um, we had a customer who was harvesting plants, laying them out on a tarp for about two hours before putting them into the dryer, and he was actually seeing um, a pretty noticeable loss just by letting those plants sit there in the sunlight not being you know, not stabilized. They weren't stabilized at that point. You know, the molecules are still volatile at that point, and you will see degradation um, really quite quickly until you have stabilized that product. Yeah, uh, I mean, I can't emphasize enough that in my opinion and experience, you're always going to experience a least amount of loss handling the material while it's wet. Um, you know, it's sticky, it's resinous, you're gonna have some loss, but you know, once it's dried, then then it's super brittle. You're gonna have a lot of loss. And I think that's one of the things, and we'll talk more about hang drying, but you know, I always tell people when you're when you're hang drying, once you think you've got it dried, hang drying, that's like just the start of the process. So 
um, and where you're going to experience the most loss now that you have to handle it, get it off the stem and all that other stuff. So handling it when it's wet is, there's gonna be loss in this process no matter what, that's gonna be your least amount of loss. Absolutely, and we will touch on that um, a little bit further into the webinar. Some other factors that affect during, or affect CBD during harvest would be when. So the obvious one would be the maturity of your plants. You know, plants grow on a certain life cycle and by the time they're mature or not mature or overly mature, you'll see slight differences in your CBD numbers that way. Um, we've seen a lot of people using autoflower seeds or autoflower starts. Um, and that's nice because that is almost on a time limit. You know, you put them in the ground and six weeks later or whatever the determined time length is, your plants are done on the dime pretty much. So that's a nice way to kind of eliminate some of those factors or some of those unknowns, especially if you're getting into the space. Autoflower seeds or autoflower starts kind of eliminate some of those factors or some of that guesswork. Um, another thing that affects CBD during harvest would be the time of the year. So ambient moisture, temperatures, weather, if it's rained recently, all of these will have slight effects on how you're going to want to dry in the CBD levels. Another important one that people don't maybe consider is the time of day. So if you're harvesting in the morning, you're going to have more moisture, meaning more moisture that you need to pull out of your plants. Um, it makes sense, you know, you wake up in the morning and you look out onto your lawn and your lawn's wet with dew. Same thing with hemp fields, you know, there are a lot more moisture in the morning. So if you can, especially if you're preparing to harvest, we'll look at the weather, definitely watch the weather reports, um, and then try to harvest in, you know, the afternoon time if you have that luxury. I know the USDA um, harvest plans are kind of hammering down the regulations on that. Um, so just kind of refer to your own state's harvest plan regulations. And then one more thing is time until drying. Ideally, you're gonna want your plants to go directly from the field into a dryer, but not everybody has that luxury. Um, but it is worth mentioning that the longer product sits before drying, the more degradation you will see. Yeah, I mean, you know, touching on maturity, that's an important thing to remember if you even have a few acres, you know, if the, if the plants in one section of the field are mature, then they're probably mature across the entire field. And that means that field needs to all come down right now. Um, and that's where a lot of people can get themselves into trouble, underestimating the amount of work and space they're going to need to do that. And what they sometimes find out at two, three acres in is that, uh, they're not gonna get it all down before they lose the rest. So it's important to remember that when one part of your crop is mature, most likely the rest is mature and you wanna have a good plan for how you can get it all down pretty quick. What Matthew and I have seen a lot in our cannabis experience that we're not quite seeing in hemp just yet is that in cannabis, everything is done on a rotation. You know, you'll plant a small section, wait a couple of weeks, plant another section, wait a couple of weeks, plant another section. That way you're not dealing with, you know, entire fields of plants that are ready to come down right now. You know, by doing it on that rotation, you can harvest this little chunk, dry it, stabilize it, put it into storage. By then, your next little chunk is ready for harvest. Harvest it, dry it, put it in storage. And doing it that way, it's that way you're not dealing with an entire field that's screaming, harvest me right now. I mean, you're just dealing in a little bit more minor chunks. Um, unfortunately, not everywhere in the country has weather that um, cooperates with this, but somewhere maybe like California or Arizona or even Florida, places with a little bit longer growing seasons, I would definitely consider trying to grow on a rotation. Um, what I've always yeah. found interesting is that cannabis and hemp are dealt with very, um, very differently, but it's the same general plan, you know, the same general growing styles that we use in recreational cannabis can be adapted into the hemp space. Yeah, and, and while it might not be always feasible in a field situation, if you're familiar at all with light deprivation or how that works, I mean, that's how a lot of outdoor growers uh, are able to, um, you know, have shoulder crops really or really start earlier in the season and or have a rotation like Shana was talking about with an outdoor crop where, uh, and that involves controlling the light cycle, right? I mean, that's something we can do indoor easily and, and why you can get it on that constant harvest. But I think you know, like Shauna said, uh, a lot of the same growing principles apply. So, you know, if you're in an area that has a lot of old greenhouse space, or if you're not opposed to uh, pulling a lot of tarps and PVC pipe, there are a lot of possibilities for, uh, 
you know, applying what we know about producing cannabinoids to, you know, hemp in the same similar type ways, really depending on what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So I definitely, I mean, I've worked with operations where they literally, they've got a light deprivation op operation where they're taking down a new tunnel uh, of, of light depth every week for um, March until October, right? So it, it's very possible if you have the right environment. Exactly. So with another thing that kind of relates hemp and cannabis is the, the traditional drying methods, which is hang drying. And that's a lot of what I did in my past life. Um, and what I've seen, hang drying has considerable space requirements. So we've seen anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 square feet per acre. So these are huge drying areas that are needed um, to kind of keep up with hemp production. And with that being said, it also has significant time requirements. Um, it's anywhere from seven to 21 days. Um, and like Matthew said, when you're, especially if you're going for smokable, getting it dry is only half the battle. You know, you still have to cure it. You have to get that nice smell to it. You have to get that beautiful crisp. There's a lot of things that you need to do that are worked into the smokable flower process um, to just keep that in mind. Um, hang drying is batch drying, so it's not continuous flow like we talked about. Um, you're only able to dry batches at a time for, you know, seven to 21 days per batch, um, depending on, you know, a number of factors. Um, generally, hang drying is considered the best for smokable flour. Um, it's the same in cannabis. Anything that's been, that's going to be smokable flour is typically hung dried. Um, hang drying is not scalable other than just building bigger and bigger and bigger buildings. Um, it's just not scalable. We like to joke at IEC that there's not enough arms and barns for where the, where the industry is heading. Um, I got really strong shoulders from hang drying, but it wasn't necessarily um, a scalable practice relating to the hemp industry in general. Um, it can also be a little unreliable and inconsistent. The main thing about hang drying is that you're consistently rotating your fans, moving your dehumidifiers. You're playing with air circulation. That's what hang drying is. Um, so you need to be consistently rotating those fans. If you leave a fan too close to product or pointing at product or you haven't moved it in a very long time, the product closest to the fan or the dehumidifier will be very crispy dry while product um, a little bit further from the, the, from the dehumidifiers or the fans will be a little bit wet. So it's a little bit more inconsistent and unreliable um, in terms of you know, hemp drying methods. It can also be dangerous. Unfortunately, we saw a lot of articles last year in Oregon, um, or at least that's where I saw most of the articles. Um, we're out of Oregon, where hemp drying barns were actually catching fire and burning to the ground. Um, that's dangerous, you know, you're losing your entire crop um, and it's unfortunate, you know, a lot of people are using these old school tobacco drying barns, um, but they're not built for the electrical needs of drying hemp. They're not, you know, they're not wired for heat or, you know, the electrical needs, like I said, for the fans and the dehumidifiers. So while it's a very old practice, um, it's just not really scalable with where the industry is going. I also put a little um, symbol at the top here. That's the symbol called ma, and that's the Chinese symbol for hemp. And they actually designed that symbol to look like hemp drying in a barn. So that long division symbol at the top is actually a shed. And then you see the plants hanging upside down from the barn. So I thought that was pretty interesting. This character has been around for, you know, over a thousand years. So this is a very, very traditional method of drying cannabis. Yeah, and like we mentioned before, it's all relative to the product that you're trying to produce. You know, if you're going to produce a smokable flower product, then you absolutely want to take these steps uh, to produce the kind of product people are going to want to smoke. Um, but for most every other purpose, uh, it's really not the efficient way to do it at scale. Um, you really need to kind of let go of that part of, of the past of the plant and, you know, look towards the future, which is much more of an agricultural harvest um, using big equipment instead of uh, so much human labor. And like we said earlier, you know, once your plants are dry, they are extremely brittle. I remember ha uh, harvesting, or we called the binning for the curing process. I remember binning my plants that had been dried by hang drying methods and Keith was flying off of it. They would literally poof off like spores. 
Um, and it really does solidify the fact that if you're going to handle your plants, do it when they're wet. That's when they can take the most beating. By the time they're dry, you know, that keef, those trichomes are extremely brittle. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I yeah, it, it uh, bucking and all that stuff, you know, it definitely you should try to do that wet. The least, the you know, like we mentioned before, the, the you're going to do the least amount of damage when it's wet. So try to knock out those most violent type of processes. Even, you know, if you're doing a um, bucking it and running it through a machine trimmer and letting it dry in trays at a bigger volume, that's a, you know, I think that's a better model than letting all that stuff hang on a stem, then dealing with it when it's dry, if you're trying to go for, you know, that sort of machined price point. Um, but yeah, do the damage when it's wet. Exactly. And especially too, when it's wet, we've had people come to us, you know, oh no, I'm seeing some resin build up on my shredders. Well then scrape it off and process it. You know what I mean? That's not, that's not loss. Anything that's collecting in your equipment that you can salvage, that's not loss. You know, that's just something that you're going to process a little bit differently than the majority of your biomass. I get yeah, this question we... a lot. So wait a second, doesn't mechanical drying cause CBD loss? And the answer is not necessarily. You know, we've kind of been going through some of the things that affect CBD during harvest. And now we're going to chat a little bit about factors affecting CBD during drying. So some of the main factors um, affecting CBD or terpenes or anything like that during drying would be heat and time. So cannabinoids like CBD, CBN, CBG, they can all burn off in contact with high temperatures. So you can see on the right hand of the screen, we have the boiling points of different cannabis compounds. So CBD actually boils off at about 356 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, CBN at about 365, terpenes like limonene at uh, 349, myrcene at 337 or 334. Um, so these are, when you look at them, they're relatively high numbers as compared to say room temperature, but in the drying process, it's not very tricky to reach those temperatures. Um, you know, terpenes and flavonoids are also damaged by high heat, but what's key is that it's heat versus time, not just heat. So it does have to be extended periods of heat, which result in considerable loss. So there's the argument between low and slow versus fast and moderate. A system like IECs, we use relatively low temperatures, um, but it's such a quick dry time, or I'm sorry, relatively high air temperatures, but we have such a quick dry time that we're not letting the biomass reach high enough temperatures where we're burning things like cannabinoids or terpenes or flavonoids off. Um, so there's definitely that argument I get, I hear a lot of times, you can never go above 90 degrees when you dry hemp. I mean, if you're going to hang dry, sure, but that's just, that's not really realistic. There's a lot of myths in this space. So yes, you definitely don't want to be blasting your product with heat, but the time component is so, so very critical. If you're blasting uh, biomass with high heat for, say, a second, you really won't see too much loss where if you're blasting biomass at, say, 170 degrees for five hours, you know, you'll see a little bit more loss that way. Um, there's a lot more studies that need to be done, but we've seen some pretty promising results. Yeah, um, and that's, like Shauna said, we, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to get your head around it all, but um, like in a system like ours where the material never stops moving, even though we have some hot air temperatures, the material never gets above, you know, a temperature where we feel a little comfortable. And we know from tests that we've done that, you know, hang drying is gonna experience about a point of CBD or cannabinoid loss just in a regular process, right? So there's always gonna be some kind of loss. It's just a question of how do you minimize that while also creating the most effective process. Exactly, Matthew, you're exactly right. There is no way to save every single molecule. Unfortunately, there's just not. Um, and we like to joke too, don't spend dollars to save pennies. You know, this whole industry is kind of about compromising, a little bit about picking your battles. You know, so are you okay with a little bit of loss up front by shredding it wet, knowing you'd see more loss on the backside by shredding it? You know, it's definitely up to you what compromises and what battles you're willing to take up. Yeah, exactly. And everybody's going to, you know, have a little bit difference to their operation. And it's, you know, something that you'll 
certainly figure out over time what, what works best for you. Absolutely. So another thing we wanted to talk about is decarboxylation. <laughs> We're going to do some decarb myth busting here. So decarb uses heat and time to unlock the therapeutic effects of uh, cannabinoids. So it is a very, very important process, um, but it needs to be done deliberately. So hemp naturally contains CBDA, which needs to be activated using heat and time to make CBD. So this little graph I have at the bottom, the top part shows CBDA, the bottom part shows CBD or just CBD. So you can see as time goes on and as temperatures raise, you see that conversion to CBD. So like I said, very, very important part of the process, but timing is everything. It needs to be a deliberate process and not a byproduct of drying. So typically in my experience, you would decarb for maybe 220 degrees for maybe 30 minutes. And that would be if I was making, say, butter. Um, if you were to smoke flour, by actually lighting it with a lighter, that fire, that combustion is what causes decarboxylation. So very, very important, but needs to be deliberate. By decarbing, that means that you're seeing high periods of heat for extended periods of time. So I actually spoke with somebody who sent his wet biomass out to be toll dried. He got it back and he said the majority of his product had been decarbed. So that told him that his product had been dried way too high temperatures for way too long. Definitely needs to be deliberate and not a byproduct. So if you're decarbing, you're going to see loss. You know that decarbing and drying are two totally separate ideas. There's pros and cons to decarbing before drying, during drying, after drying, during extraction. Um, really depends on what you're going for, but I do not want decarbing and drying to be looked at similar or even comparable processes. Yeah, and like you said, the most important thing is that you want to be in control of when that material is, is decarbed and not have it be a byproduct of the drying process because it shouldn't be. You know, there are processes that keep the material below the, the decarb points, which people will argue about CBD, but it's like 155 for THC. I think CBD is right below that. Um, so, so, yeah, you know, we've that's what you really need to be looking at is, is what is the length amount of time that it's going to be exposed to the heat. Yep, there is a pretty widely circulated decarb graph um, as it compares to THC. Um, and experts seem to agree that THC decarbs at lower temperatures and for shorter periods of time than CBD does. So that gives you a little bit more wiggle room on the CBD side, but just something to be aware of. Another thing to be aware of is moisture versus capacity. So this is a graph of moisture versus capacity of two of our systems. So as you can see, as the input or the in-feed moisture content raises, your capacity drops almost exponentially. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind. Moisture content affects your capacity. Higher moisture content biomass typically takes more time and energy to dry just because the majority or more of what that sample is made of is just water. So a couple of little tips and tricks would be to avoid excess moisture during a harvest. So you can stop watering during a harvest. Um, we do a little bit of this on the recreational side to tell your plants, you know, your death is coming, your life cycle is coming to an end. Pump your potency into your buds and, you know, do what you're going to do. Um, another thing would be to not harvest in the morning, like I mentioned, and then try to avoid harvesting after a rain. You know, that's just excess moisture that's going to be in your crop, making it a little bit harder for you to dry on the backside. One trick that we've seen if your product is overly wet um, would be to condition your feed. And what that is, is that's taking very, very wet material, so maybe 80% moisture um, product, and mixing dry material with that. So what that does is that actually increases your dryer performance and your capacity, because if you were putting, say, let's look at this graph here, um, the 6,000, so the orange line, if we were putting 80% moisture in, we would be seeing you know, almost 1,500 dry pounds per hour. Whereas if we were able to knock that down to say 60% by either conditioning or doing a couple of different tricks, you would see almost a double in that capacity just by eliminating 10% moisture. So it really is an exponential gain that we see, um, or I'm sorry, exponential loss in capacity when we're looking at overly wet feed. 
Another thing I want to throw out there is that input weight does not equal output weight. Well, I'm putting 3,000 pounds in, I should get 3,000 pounds out, right? Not necessarily because, you know, 70% of that 3,000 pounds is just water. So typically I see a three to one weight reduction from wet to dry feed at that 70% moisture content, which seems to be kind of the standard across the country. We've seen a little bit lower in drier places and we've seen a little bit higher in wetter places, but 70 kind of seems to be that, that sweet spot. Ain't gonna lie, that just was silly. Silly, can somebody, somebody's like having some feedback here. Okay, I think I got it. All right, Matthew, are you good? Yeah, just like Shauna said, it, it really is an exponential change when you start getting into the 80s plus. So it just is going to affect the output. We can dry, we've dried really, really wet material. Uh, you can certainly dry it, but it's just going to take a lot longer to do it. Absolutely. Um, so we like to talk about that full that full supply chain. So what comes after drying is processing. So to make it a little bit easier on yourselves and your processors, what are your processors looking for? You know, typically they're looking for dry, stabilized biomass, anywhere between seven to ten percent moisture. Um, they're looking for material that's free of mold or mildew. Um, higher testing material typically takes priority. Obviously, the higher the CBD numbers, the more money you can make off of biomass. Um, they're going to want something that's got no excess fiber, which is that stock and stem material. In that top picture, you can see what we call a bird's nest. So fiber loves to find itself. <laughs> During processing, it loves to find itself and build these nice big hairballs. So by removing that excess fiber, that improves your capacities and that improves the performance of your equipment as well. Fiber also tends to delete, uh, dilute CBD numbers. So you may be artificially testing lower than you could be if you're having excess fiber. They're also looking for finely shredded material. So I get this pushback a lot. You expect me to chop up my colas? You expect me to just shred it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, coming from the cannabis side, Matthew and I definitely have a reverence for the plant, but its applications are different in this space. Processors are going to shred your material anyway. They're going to hammer mill it. And like we said earlier, the, the more handling you can do in the beginning, the less loss you'll see. So knowing that your CBD processors are going to hammer mill your material, you can get that, get that over with in the beginning. That, uh, that especially in our dryers affects the capacity and the performance by really shredding it because that gives the moisture nowhere to hide. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's something that I know that it's, uh, it is sort of a challenge to think about how we're going to, you know, uh, process this and deal with it at such a big scale, but it does really require you to let go of any kind of, uh, you know, preciousness about it because um, when you're talking about tens of thousands of pounds, it's, it's a whole different thing. So, um, and that's why we sort of talked about really thinking about your whole process all the way through. You know, if you know the extractors don't want excess fiber, then, you know, where are other places in your process where you can try to get that out? Is it the right piece of harvesting equipment that'll help you get that out? Is it, you know, some of the available um, sorting equipment that's out there on the back end? I mean, there's, we've seen it done lots of different ways, but just knowing what that end product that they want is, which is a hammer milled, mostly fiber free material, uh, because that's going to improve their outputs and their profitability. So, so yeah, just like we've said, work backwards and see where in the process you can try to, you know, automate and simplify this and not get caught at the end with material they have a harder time selling. Absolutely. So a couple of recommended practices for shredding CBD biomass. Feed is key. Any dryer system that requires shredded biomass or just any dryer system in general, really, what you put into it directly affects what you get out of it. So by removing excess stock and stem material as early as you can, it's improving your capacity, improving your dryer performance, and then improving your end product as well. It'll make your producer or your processors a lot happier. Um, again, avoid any excess moisture. You're gonna want uniform, free-flowing, consistent product. <clears throat> And by doing that, you can get a small chop 
would result in a more consistent dry. So the smaller you shred your material, the less places the moisture can hide. So stock stems and buds can hide moisture in the middle while drying on the outside. So they look like they're dry, they feel crispy like they're dry, but they're hiding moisture in the middle. And when that's left alone, that actually can wick out, rehydrating your product, which can lead to mold. I had somebody call me and said, hey, you know, I ran a bunch of fiber through a dryer. Um, I put it into a paper bag and within a week, the paper bag had completely molded through. And I said, well, how thick were the stalks and stems? And he said, oh, they were, you know, probably an inch in diameter and they were, you know, pencil size long sticks. And I said, well, no wonder they molded. Look at all of that room, all of that area you gave the moisture to hide out. So you're, you know, they looked dry, they felt dry, they snapped nicely. But the second you walked away, that moisture just wicked back out. And then you've got a wet, unstabilized product again. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> that can be a thing, you know. I mean, when you're thinking about how you're going to store all this biomass, you know, people have issues with rehydration and these sort of things. So, again, you just don't want to, if you can remove it earlier in the process, then you don't have to have a problem with it later. Um, and like you said, I, I, you know, there's maybe a couple of the really smaller food dehydrator type systems that don't really look for a chopped material, but anything else, you know, we don't see a lot of people talking about feed, but we know from our experience that the key to being able to successfully dry it down below 10% um, really is having that kind of fine material that uh, lets any dryer really use the surface area it needs to dry. Absolutely. A couple other recommended practices. So you're going to want to avoid stagnant air or product really at any point in the process, whether that's growing or drying. Um, it may lead to uneven drying, it may lead to mold. Um, this picture here is actually at a facility that Matthew and I worked at, and this is a little bit of that light deprivation that he had been mentioning. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, that facility, Matthew? Yeah, we had seven greenhouses like this there, um, and we were lucky because we had nice motors to pull all the tarps, um, but all of this area you were able to block off on a uh, set cycle so that even during the longer days of the summer we could still keep 12 hour light cycles. Um, but one of the problems that came with that was making sure that we had enough ventilation when those tarps were down in, uh, in those particular units. So, and as a result, that facility actually struggled a lot with powdery mildew and some other things until we were able to improve the ventilation. So. Little things like that are incredibly important, especially if you're in a wetter, uh, you know, a more moist, humid environment. You know, the more you can do to have good airflow in any situation is going to be to your benefit. Absolutely. We've said this a couple of times today, but we're going to say it again. The less handling, the better. And if you do need to handle it, handle it when it's wet when your plants can take the most beating, when you won't see as much loss, or at least the loss you do see is semi-recoverable. Yeah, I mean- storage? Oh, go for it, Matthew. No, I was just gonna say, I mean, I think what we're really hoping and what we're trying to promote is the idea that, and, and I think it's gonna become more and more of a reality though, that as the equipment gets there, but you know, you can really take your harvest of however many acres you have and have that go from the field to stabilized in the super stacks or totes in a in a day in a matter of hours you know um, that's what we should be shooting for not hang dry it let's see how long we can make this last like we can get into a process where and that's how you're going to minimize you know not the loss and 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 keep the most potency in the plant right by just getting it chopped once into a dryer into a bag ready to go Right? That seems like, you know, three steps as opposed to harvest it, dry it, store it, shred it, chop it, separate it. You know, just all these steps you'll see, you know, you'll see associated loss. So the less steps, the better. And, you know, I mean, we're in an industry right now where everybody is really, I believe, doing their best to come up with the next best piece of equipment and the next best solution. But, you know, we've all heard, or at least I have heard many stories about pieces of equipment that didn't really uh, pan out the way they wanted to. So, so that's important to remember too, you know, and not overcomplicate it, you know, some of these bigger things. So, so that's something to remember. Look for some of the tried and true and, and some of the experienced stuff that's working. Absolutely. 
So we like to recommend climate controlled storage, any chance you get, whether that's you know storage or transportation. Um, and Matthew just hit the nail on the head in terms of equipment. Consider wet bailing if you have no access to immediate drying services. However, we do not recommend this for long-term storage. Last year, we were kind of fed the narrative that, you know, this is a get out of jail free card, just go ahead and bail it and everything's fine. And when you open up the bail, it's gonna look great. Um, that's not the case. That's absolutely not the case. And even bailing companies themselves have actually changed their narrative from last year. Um, so it's a great option if you don't have immediate access, but we definitely don't recommend it for long-term storage. And um, transportation also, bailing, uh, transporting bales seems to be a little bit easier than um, transporting just wet biomass. So do your own research. Um, there's definitely pros and cons associated with wet bailing, but I definitely encourage you to do your own research. Yeah, yeah, like Shauna said, they've kind of or changed some of their own recommendations from last year. And, and it's certainly an option, but it's just like everything. Everybody's, you know, I, anybody that tells you they've got it all figured out, we don't, right? We're all doing our best. There's a lot of new things um, and everybody's making their best effort, but it's important to you know, make sure that you do the best due diligence that you can. I know at least now, you know, I think a side uh, effect of everything that's been going on um, is that there's certainly a lot of webinars and information right now that you can get access to, which is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so who would benefit from owning a dryer? The obvious one would be farmers. You know, this allows for a quick stabilization of their crop. Um, it maximizes their yields. And then it also gives them an opportunity to make extra revenue by toll drying for other customers. Um, we sold quite a few dryers last year to farmers for their own crop. Um, and then words spread to surrounding areas. Oh, you know, so-and-so's got a dryer. Um, and, you know, many of them turned into drying facilities for others. You know, once they had dried their own crop, they had excess capacity and were able to, you know, stabilize the crop of other farmers near them. And then making a little bit of extra money doing it that way, too. Um, a lot of people jump into this space. You know, growing is glamorous. You get to work with the plants. But not everybody sees through the process. Um, you know, I get a lot of calls. I've got 400 acres in the ground. I don't know how I'm going to dry it. Oh, buddy, me neither. You know, that's something you should have thought of long before you put 400 acres in the ground. Um, so this is, that's definitely kind of become a business model in and of itself is these drying facilities. <clears throat> We've also seen co-ops work together to set up these drying facilities, and this allows entire areas access to drying services. It also seems to be the most cost effective because a bunch of people go in together and then everybody gets use of this dryer. Um, and the third major group of people that we see is processors. Um, having a processor own a dryer allows them to control the quality of their incoming product. Um, it also offers additional services to their customers. I like to tell my customers that are considering, considering business models like this um, to really focus on being that one-stop shop for farmers. You know, maximize the a la carte services that you offer. You know, if you buy a dryer, are you going to add, you know, storage? Are you going to add maybe milling services? Are you going to add maybe harvesting services or processing services on the backside? You know, really becoming that one-stop shop for farmers. Um, I've spoken to multiple farmers who, you know, they grew it. They're like, I'm done. You know, I did my end of the deal. Somebody else needs to process this. Somebody else needs to sell this. Um, so just, yeah, really being that one-stop shop has been pretty successful from what we've seen. One more important point is who should consider how a product is dried? Everyone, even if you're in the retail space, you should at least consider how your product is dried. You know, if you're making cookies, but you burn the butter, you know, it doesn't matter. You're not gonna have an A quality final product because you didn't have A quality ingredients going into it. Yeah. Um... It's really, you know, I think for this industry to really grow and, and flourish the way that I expect it to, we need more infrastructure to provide more predictability so that farmers, like Shauna said, can be farmers and that we have a, you know, these kind of facilities for them to contract with and know that they're going to be able to take down and dry everything that they grew that season. Um, so right now, we certainly don't have enough of that infrastructure, um, but it's developing. But that's really what it is. It's, a, you know, the infrastructure to support 
the supply chain. And, you know, we really have found toll drying is a way to make money um, because a lot of those folks, the best thing we can do for somebody that calls up Shauna with 400 acres is connect them with one of our customers that has a dryer and maybe get them into a toll drying situation because, you know, it takes a little bit of time to get a dryer installed. Um, but that's just something to think. There's going to be a lot of people come harvest time that didn't think about it. And we, we still have customers right now that are transporting and drying baled material throughout the rest of the year. So there's certainly an opportunity to keep the dryer running as much as you want to um, if you're out there looking at what's going on in the market and, and trying to make sure that you're you know, capitalizing on everything. Yeah, absolutely. I would say um, to definitely join you know, organizations or chapters or groups near you. Um, if you're considering opening up a facility like this, figure out what the need is. You know, find an area where there's a lot of farmers that are growing and maybe that infrastructure doesn't exist for drying or stabilizing. Um, that's something that I would recommend. Yeah, and you know, we've also, something as a company we're starting to look at more. Um, we've seen some folks started to have a little bit of success in, you know, some economic development funds that might be available in your area for a co-op project or to bring this kind of infrastructure in. So. That's something also to think about, you know, have certainly benefits from the fact that it's federally legal. I've spent a lot of time in the cannabis space where the answer is no, you can't do that because it's not legal. Um, but because hemp has certain benefits to that, I think, you know, looking and looking at the state level, what are they doing to try to promote hemp in their state and, and the infrastructure that's needed? So um, I think there's, you know, certainly a lot of different ways to come at this, uh, but it's certainly very needed. Absolutely. That's a really great point, Matthew. Um, there's a lot of resources out there, too. You guys are all part of the Hemp Industries Association, so that's a great start. Our members only section has some really, really great resources there. Um, another thing I recommend, especially if you're trying to focus mostly on your state level, the USDA website actually has a list of the point person for the hemp programs in each state, along with usually their email and their um, cell phone number as well. So feel free to reach out to these people. These are the designated hemp program people in your state. So if you have any questions on resources or you know government funds available, these were the people that I would reach out to. Yeah, great point, Shana. Um, yeah, it's a really unique time and then you know everything is so new and exciting and there's a, a lot of opportunity in that. And, um... Absolutely. So our closing message or the take home message is we really want you to think about drying in terms of stabilization. Yes, it's an important part of the process, but it's just that, it's just a part. You are stabilizing your crop so it is not actively degrading while you figure out what your next steps are or you, you, know, you get it to your process or if you've already figured that out um, as you're getting into this. So think about it in terms of stabilization. It's a time to just catch your breath for a second and then move in a different direction. Exactly. You want to be able to have control over your harvest. Uh, and the best way to do that is to get it stabilized and not necessarily have to be part of the same rush uh, to market that everybody finds themselves into. So that's really the, the key. Absolutely. So per the HIA, we will not be taking questions. However, if you do have any questions, please, please, please feel free to reach out to us at info at iecompanies.com. You can check out our website at ie-thermo.com. We're also pretty active on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Um, we've actually been running a webinar series of our own called Webinar Wednesdays. Um, where we cover a variety of different hemp-related topics. Um, we've got this recording on YouTube as well. Um, yeah, follow us on Facebook for more info. Our next week's webinar will be really interesting. We'll actually be sitting down with two different hemp farmers who own an IEC dryer and did a little bit of toll drying in addition to farming their own hemp. Um, so that'll be a really, really interesting one. Follow us on Facebook or check out our website uh, for a little bit more info on that. Fantastic. Well, yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Uh, we wish you all good luck in this growing season, and uh, we'll hope to see you again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.